Welcome everyone to our first uh, seminar of the academic year at the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. Uh, we have a long tradition at this point uh, at the Graduate Center since 2009 and prior to that uh, originally at George Mason University and then at Temple University and now at the Graduate Center of CUNY. And um, really delighted to, um, to be featuring uh, an exciting speaker today. Um, we regret that we can't have her in person, but maybe on her next trip to New York, she'll uh, be willing to uh, give an in-person talk. Um, and as um, most of you know, our next or the rest of our talks will be um, will be in person, and we will hope to have a Zoom um, um, simultaneous broadcast so that people can join from around wherever they may be. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm delighted to see former fellows like John and present fellows and distinguished faculty like Virginia and our big supporter, Hugo, and, um, and uh, a number of the graduate student fellows who I'm very um, pleased will be joining us. So today, um, uh, Alasia Nuti will be giving a talk and uh, she's currently um, senior lecturer in political theory at the University of York. And uh, her work has won a number of prizes. Her uh, PhD work uh, received a prize um, when she was completing her degree at the University of Cambridge. And then her first book has achieved quite a bit of attention. Um, it's a very interesting approach. Um, to the use of the idea of structural injustice, um, also in the context of history, which is an important new direction in thinking about structural injustice. So that book was called Injustice and the Reproduction of History, Structural Injustice, Gender and Redress. And that received an honorable mention from the ECPR uh, Prize in Political Theory. And um, I understand that we're getting a little bit of an introduction to her new work, which should uh, come out as a monograph, um, uh, which is a revised account of political liberalism and the task of containment. I would like to know what you mean by containment, but I think we can save that for maybe another occasion. Um, does that new book have a title yet, the political liberalism one? Uh, yes, yeah, so it, it has a, a, it's a provisional title, so it's a, a political liberalism and the containment of a liberal and anti-democratic views in society, so it's still, uh, yeah, a, a working title, we are trying to um, find a, a sexier title, but <laughs> it's, it's difficult, right, because you want to be informative, but also, right, yeah, right. try to catch the attention of people, so, yeah. Great. Uh, so your talk today uh, is provocatively entitled, uh, Must the Sub Subalterns Speak Publicly? Political Liberalism and the Ethics of Fighting Severe Injustice. So um, we welcome you and we'll have a Q&A after, but please uh, give us your talk first. I'm excited so, about well yeah, so thank you very much for uh, the, uh, the invitation. Thanks to Carol and Patricia. It's it's really a pleasure to be like here, even if just virtually. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, and it's really a pleasure to present uh, this new work of mine, which is co-authored with Gabriele Badano, um, who is, uh, by the way, my partner, but also my colleague uh, at the uh, uh, Department of Politics, University of York. Uh, apologies in advance if you're going to hear a baby uh, screaming and crying, but my my baby is just downstairs with his, his father so you know th there may be some kind of weird <laughs> noises in the background so I just want to um, tell you in advance so I'm gonna share some uh, uh, slides uh, uh, with you can you all see the slides perfect mm -hmm. all right so um this is uh, a um, so my talk is based on uh, a, uh, a paper that I uh, quote with Gabriele Badano. Uh, the paper is part of a larger project, but it also aims to um, be a, a self-standing uh, um, uh, article. So there are some bits that are related to the, the larger project, but uh, uh, in a sense, the, the, 
the, the containment uh, part of the project won't necessarily come up uh, as much in, uh, in uh, this uh, article. But of course, I'm also very happy to talk about that in the uh, Q&A. So I'll, I'll give you a bit of an overview of uh, uh, the, the broader project. So uh, uh, as uh, Italians, uh, we, we, we are quite concerned about uh, the, the spread of uh, illiberal and anti-democratic views in our uh, societies. We think that our societies have lots of problems. So if they, they are defined as liberal democratic, they are all, all li really imperfect. Uh, um, incarnation of that uh, uh, idea, um, but we are re really worried about uh, the, the further regression into liberalism and anti-democracy uh, uh, that many of our societies are uh, are experiencing right now, right? And of course, I also have the Italian elections, right? The recent Italian uh, elections in, uh, in mind. Um, so, our project, um, broader project, uh, aims to provide uh, the, uh, the first account of uh, how uh, society should uh, try to contain the, uh, the spread of views uh, that are uh, uh, illiberal, so they basically uh, views that don't respect uh, basic liberal rights, uh, and they also are anti-democratic from the perspective of political liberalism. And this is a, a quite a new thing because even if um, uh, rules political liberalism is centered on the idea of reasonableness, and I'll come back to that in my talk, uh, um, uh, and Rawls uh, himself uh, uh, explains that uh, um, the task of containment might be an urgent one, there is no fully fledged account of what that means. Uh, and that connects with uh, larger debates about uh, uh, liberal democratic self-defense. So how if a society um, or like, citizens are committed to uh, liberal democratic ideas, how can they defend, they defend uh, liberal democracy without violating uh, its main uh, uh, principles, right? Uh, but in doing so, uh, the, the, the project also aims to provide a, a new account of the project of political liberalism, um, an account that we hope is going to be more attractive, um, can actually reply to some of the serious and important concerns that critics of political liberalism have um, developed, uh, and actually show that if proper uh, the developed political liberalism can be a very useful and uh, uh, sophisticated framework to think about uh, uh, disagreement in our societies and also uh, to think about injustice in our society. And I guess that uh, uh, the, the talk today and the paper the talk is based on um, is mainly focused on this aspect of the, the our broader project. So how actually uh, people have criticized the political liberalism in, in some respect. Uh, and we take this critique very seriously because we think that actually if they, 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 they really, if, if they hit the target, then it would be a real problem for uh, the, the framework. But we think that actually political liberals as the resources to reply and, and uh, um, become, as I was saying, an, an attractive framework to navigate uh, uh, pluralism. So just to give you, a sense of what uh, the, the book is, is about. Uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, the book is uh, divided into parts. The, the first part uh, is the more theoretical and philosophical and aims to uh, reconstruct uh, a, a better, uh, a more political, uh, if you want, like version of political liberalism. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the paper is a version of uh, chapter three uh, of uh, uh, the book. Um, and then the second part of uh, the book focuses on the task of containment. Uh, and our strategy in the book is actually uh, looking at some uh, actors uh, um, that we think uh, should have the duties to um, um, contain illiberal and anti-democratic views. In particular, we focus on uh, uh, non-statal uh, actors. Uh, um, for, first and foremost, uh, because uh, we think that, you know, sometimes it may be too late, right? In a sense, uh, sometimes the state is already 
captured by these uh, um, groups. Um, and so we focus on um, uh, the role of common citizens, the role of uh, partisan, and uh, uh, the role of uh, cities uh, and municipalities. Um, so this is just a bit the, a, a general view of the uh, the project. So as I was saying, not so much on containment, uh, this talk, but to give you a bit a sense of uh, uh, the, the the overall uh, project. Okay, so. What exactly I'm gonna do uh, today in the talk? So um, think about uh, how basically all uh, uh, protest for uh, social international injustice, uh, uh, not all, but many protest, uh, um, include some uh, disruptive and violent uh, action. So just to give an example, uh, even uh, the uh, uh, protest by uh, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, after the murder of George Floyd, which were like largely right peaceful, still including some disruption and violent action. Right, so for example, uh, the, uh, um, the the third police uh, police precinct was set on fire. There was some destruction of a public uh, private pro property, like media companies, and so on. Right, um, and when uh, uh, this kind of actions takes place, right, uh, we usually have uh, the, the standard like commentators who may side with the, the reasons uh, of uh, oppressed groups uh, uh, who are uh, protesting, but you know, very carefully immediately say, oh, you know, protests should be peaceful, right? So no matter like what uh, the the reasons for protesting are. Uh, uh, as soon as the, the protest becomes violent uh, and disruptive, then uh, there's a problem with that, right? Um, so, you know, the sort of standard calls for civility. Now, um, Russian political liberalism uh, um, has been criticized uh, by uh, some scholars uh, precisely because it seems that uh, it cannot account uh, for uh, uh, disruptive and violent action, uh, even when this action is uh, taken by groups uh, that are suffering from oppression. Um, and by disruptive and violent action, I mean uh, everything that can go from uh, 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 actions that uh, like bring everyday activity to standstill, boycotts, uh, 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 unauthorized picketing, uh, um, event disruption, sabotage, damage, to and destruction of property, right? So this sort of uh, type of, uh, uh, of action. Um, and uh, um, as I will, I will uh, uh, go through uh, in a uh, few minutes, uh, we think that uh, those scholars uh, who have criticized Russian political liberalism have actually good reasons to think that uh, um, this type of action sometimes uh, is valuable, right? For different reasons, right? So we kind of, uh, uh, take very seriously this this objection because we think that they they um, come from a really um, uh, important place. Uh, we just disagree that uh, uh, Russian politicalism can take uh, account of uh, can carve out a space for this type of action. Uh, so my goal for today will be to reply to this. Uh, um, uh, cluster of objection, but also in doing so, also showing that. Uh, uh, maybe surprisingly for some, uh, political liberties can become a nuanced uh, framework that actually offers a normative guidance uh, uh, for how different groups uh, in, uh, uh, in society should seek uh, political uh, uh, change. So the sort of uh, moral constraints that different groups uh, in, uh, uh, in society uh, have on their uh, political action. Uh, okay, so uh, I will start by providing some background uh, of, uh, of the political liberal framework uh, and uh, um, go through the uh, uh, two power objection against it. Uh, I'll, in replying to this objection, I will put forward what is uh, our uh, uh, a, a novel account uh, in the literature of when uh, the, the duty, the Russian duty of public reason, uh, should apply in uh, circumstances that are not ideal, 
a view which we call the no self-sacrifice view. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll finally put forward a new research agenda for political liberals, uh, which uh, precisely is about uh, the constraints uh, uh, in terms of the, the moral constraints in, uh, in searching for uh, uh, political uh, change that social groups in society that are not bound by public reason should uh, uh, meet. Um, in the paper, we uh, feel quite confident about uh, putting forward like two uh, conditions uh, um, and then we, we leave for others and maybe for ourselves uh, in uh, in another day when we <laughs> manage to submit the, uh, the book manuscript to figure out uh, other possible uh, conditions. Okay, so I'm not sure uh, like how familiar you are with the Russian public uh, uh, reason framework. Uh, now, you know, generally, when uh, um, I, I present uh, on uh, Russian political liberalism, I'll give the sort of full and very like painful in detail story uh, about reasonable disagreement, uh, uh, basically rules uh, um, attempt to um, uh, found uh, uh, liberal legitimacy in the face of reasonable pluralism and so on. But uh, unless you really want me to, uh, I, I won't do that in the, in the talk, because in a sense, uh, some part of that story that many of you may have already heard uh, of is not so essential uh, for uh, this paper. So this paper is not so much about uh, the classical uh, uh, debate uh, on uh, uh, comprehensive reason and public reason, uh, uh, but usually political liberals you know, really love uh, spending their time uh, on. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it talks about public reason in a sense, in a bit of a, a more basic level, but we think a level that uh, very often even political liberals uh, have forgotten about, and it's actually very important. Um, so what I'm going to say about uh, rules public reason, and again, like in the q and I'm very happy to uh, elaborate on uh, all of this, is that according to rules, uh, um, we, we have a duty of uh, uh, public reason, uh, um, which is duty of public justification when uh, uh, we make some decision. And the, the duty of public reason, um, according to rules, uh, binds uh, generally uh, public uh, officials uh, who have to justify their decision through public reasons, reasons that are basically public, uh, and they, they don't uh, draw on the comprehensive doctrines, right, including, for example, the religion that uh, public officials might have. But interestingly, uh, the duty of public reason, according to rules, also applies to common citizens uh, in particular uh, uh, for um, so, for example, when common citizens are voting uh, into uh, voting like public officials into office, or even when they are engaging in political advocacy, such as in political campaigns, they are bound by public reason. Um, public reason, according to rules, applies whenever constitutional essentials or matters of basic justice are at issue, and other political liberals, like Jonathan Kwong, actually even uh, very good arguments for why uh, public reason should apply uh, uh, every time actually coercive powers in play, you know, not, not only uh, in a very kind of narrow, when it comes to a very um, narrow uh, range of issues. Um, but what is really public reason? So basically public reason uh, requires us to, um, uh, uh, to exchange uh, mutually acceptable arguments uh, when we make certain kind of political decisions. Now, um, rules uh, uh, account of public reason is uh, defined as a duty of civility um, and uh, makes political liberalism a deliberative democratic framework. So basically, according to rules, uh, we should make uh, these political decisions uh, through by, by means of reasons, right? Uh, rather than uh, through threat or coercion. So it's a typical kind of uh, 
in, in the typical deliberative democratic uh, way, right, of thinking about uh, uh, politics. Now, um, um, the, the duty of uh, uh, public reason, which is, as I was saying, described as a duty of civility, is very much uh, uh, connected, is connected anyway, with uh, a central uh, idea of uh, uh, political liberalism, which is the idea of reasonableness, right? So reasonableness is crucial uh, in uh, uh, rules of political uh, liberalism, is really at the core of uh, uh, rules ideal of what a democratic citizen should look like. And how is like reasonableness defined? Uh, so uh, according to, uh, uh, to roles, reasonable uh, uh, people are, uh, are those people who accept uh, um, some basic idea, political ideas. So the first one is that uh, uh, other people are free and equal. Uh, and the second is uh, that uh, uh, society should be governed by fair terms of cooperation among these people that should be treated as free and equal. Um, uh, reasonable people should also accept what Rawls uh, uh, call the um, uh, burdens of judgment, but the, they are not the burdens of judgment are not so crucial uh, actually in our in our project overall uh, and uh, 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 even more in, in, uh, in this uh, paper. So I won't necessarily um, explain them. Uh, so, um, of course, uh, one of the uh, usually pr problem that many find with uh, uh, political uh, uh, liberalism is that uh, 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 roles construct uh, um, fairness uh, as being about what is acceptable to reasonable uh, a person, right? So in a sense, it seems that uh, like Rolshans are just talking with uh, each other, right? Uh, um, and and that's why uh, the, the problem with uh, unreasonable people is actually so important uh, in political liberals, even if political liberals have not spent too much uh, ink on uh, um, on that issue. Um, now, generally speaking, uh, reasonable uh, um, people accept the duty of public reason. Okay. So they accept that uh, when making certain kind of political decision in certain fora, they need to provide a uh, certain kind of justification uh, and they need to provide reasons uh, as opposed to use uh, other means uh, to promote uh, their uh, uh, political agenda. So you can see why. Right. In theory, there is a, a link between uh, uh, reasonableness and the duty of uh, uh, public reason. Uh, now, uh, some scholars, as I was saying, uh, um, have moved uh, uh, what we think are quite serious and powerful objections to um, uh, political liberalism, uh, objections that uh, 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 really need a, a, a reply because, as I was saying, if they they, they really hit their target, uh, that will really deliver a, quite a, a serious blow, I think personally, uh, to the um, uh, the framework. So uh, one type of objection uh, um, is uh, um, what can, can be called a sort of a consequentialistic. Um, objection. So it's uh, associated uh, with the, um, the, the the work of uh, uh, John Mediaris, uh, Mark Steers, uh, and, and, and to a minor extent to uh, Linda Zerril's the um, critique of uh, of civility. Now, as I was saying, like public reason uh, is uh, uh, at its very core uh, um, a, um, a, a deliberative. Uh, framework, right? So calls for deliberation and not for like uh, the use of, uh, of coercion, right? So this sort of really typical spirit of deliberate democracy, you need to be moved by the force of the better argument, right? And not uh, by someone who is kind of like coercing you in, uh, in uh, uh, accepting what they are proposing. Um, and if that's the case, right, that also means that uh, disruption and violence uh, are, are not public reason. They are not reasons, right, uh, uh, 
Um, and so they will be um, excluded by the duty. Um, however, uh, we, all, uh, we all know that uh, historically, that disruption and violence delivered many important uh, uh, gains for oppressed groups, right? So sometimes it's kind of necessary to uh, achieve uh, justice uh, um, to use uh, coercion. Uh, and uh, Mediaris uh, in uh, his powerful piece uh, gives uh, um, the example of uh, new unions and civil rights movement under the uh, Roosevelt and Kennedy administration. And he, he, he explains how um, basically even if those two uh, administrations were quite sympathetic uh, towards the concerns of uh, respectively the, the unions and, uh, and civil rights movement, uh, um, they weren't the, 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 this really seems not then to, to want to take actions, right? Uh, um, and it was through some uh, disruption uh, then then uh, these two um, administration uh, decided to uh, uh, make some progress, right? Uh, uh, and so it, it, this is, I think, something quite undeniable, right? Sometimes uh, you just need to be disruptive, right? You can't just appeal to reasons uh, uh, to fight uh, against uh, uh, oppression. But just even like casting aside uh, uh, the, uh, this, this argument, uh, you may think that uh, there is a more in principle objection to the, um, the ban on the moral ban on uh, uh, disruption and violence in fighting against oppression. Um, and this is an objection that uh, uh, Sheldon Wallin uh, has directly um, made uh, uh, against uh, uh, Rawls' political liberalism, but others are working uh, uh, on uh, the, the ethics of resistance, like Candice Delmas, Juliet Hooker, and Amia Zrinizan, um, and just generally um, raised this objection uh, uh, more broadly about uh, liberalism. So, whether or not uh, disruption and violence are likely to bring about positive change uh, might not be the, the, the main concern for some uh, people, right? It might even be irrelevant because uh, given the oppression that some groups in our society face, uh, uh, this group may have every right to be angry and uh, um, uh, confrontational, right? So you can think about the case of African-Americans. So, um, uh, telling African Americans uh, uh, that uh, uh, they they need to um, behave in an appropriate and civil way while fighting against uh, the oppression they suffer from uh, uh, may be really inappropriate, right? So if uh, a society systematically fails a social group, uh, the society may have no authority to demand them uh, to act in a sort of like appropriate and civil way, right? So. Uh, it may be wrong, right, to consider this group as bound by the civility of public reasons, even just in, in principle. Okay, um, so these sort of objections uh, uh, try to mm, uh, push us to think that uh, um, disruption and violence for one reason or another, right, for consequentialist or like in principle reasons uh, are justified uh, when they are conducted by oppressed uh, groups. Uh, now, what we do in the paper to reply to this uh, uh, objection is uh, basically to argue that uh, uh, public reason, uh, and so it's uh, suffocating norms of civility, simply do not apply when it comes to those groups in society that suffer from severe injustice. Now, in so doing, uh, we are uh, uh, making a contribution to a more maybe technical debate within political liberalism, uh, which is on uh, the applicability of public reason in non-ideal conditions. So whether the duty of public reason should basically apply when uh, people are living uh, in societies where uh, uh, many others are not complying with uh, uh, public uh, reason. Uh, so, um, basically, 
what we argue in uh, uh, in uh, the paper is that uh, it's true, right, that there is a connection between uh, uh, the uh, duty of public reason and reasonableness, because uh, under certain circumstances, under ideal circumstances, uh, reasonable people do abide um, the uh, uh, duty of uh, public reason, but the two are not the same. So. Uh, public reason civility and what we take to be the more fundamental virtue of reasonableness uh, are not the same thing in political liberalism. Uh, Rawls himself uh, explains that uh, reasonable persons uh, only want to abide by public reason uh, provided others can be relied on to do the same. And that's very important. So it's not a sort of uh, unconditional um, obligation. It's not uh, um, it, even a sort of unconditional desire that reasonable persons uh, have, according to Rawls. It's already conditional on, on uh, others doing the same, right, or, or be um, relied to do the same. Now, and we think that, uh, uh, and that's, uh, we think that that actually makes, in a sense, political liberalism quite political as a framework. It's not just or mainly because uh, um, Rawls uh, uh, values so much reciprocity, right? So, because he thinks that, like, reciprocity has this intrinsic value, which is uh, instead what other people uh, working on this debate have argued. Uh, um, it is because uh, Rawls says that uh, if we cannot really rely on others uh, uh, to uh, abide by public reason, then it might be irrational or uh, self-sacrificial for us to follow public reason. Okay, so Rawls explicitly says that political liberalism is not an ethics uh, for uh, uh, saint. Uh, Right. It's a political framework for uh, like actual human beings and actual human beings have uh, right, uh, an interest uh, in not uh, sacrificing too much their core interest. So um, when it becomes irrational or self-sacrificial for you to follow public reason, and I, I'll explain also when that is uh, uh, the case, then it, 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 in a sense, it doesn't make sense to follow public reason, and Rus doesn't expect a reasonable person to do so. Now, you may wonder, right, in, in what sense um, abiding by public reason is really self-sacrificial? Um, well, actually, abiding by public reason when others are not complying um, with that duty, it involves uh, many costs. Um, the people working on this uh, kind of a bit small and more technical debate within uh, um, political liberalism have focused a lot uh, on the, how one cost of uh, um, abiding by public reason when others are not doing so um, is that you are sacrificing basically what you take to be the whole truth uh, uh, in uh, like justifying your political decisions, precisely because, as I was just mentioning before, many political liberals have uh, been a bit obsessed with uh, the fact that public reason is uh, a reason uh, that are not comprehensive, right? So if you just give public reason, uh, uh, you give a public reason to to uh, justify um, uh, your uh, uh, your decision uh, or like to to uh, proposing uh, uh, a, an agenda, um, a political agenda. Uh, you are sort of uh, um, maybe sacrificing the real reasons why you are doing so, right? You may have actually, you may think that the real reasons are religious reasons and you, you don't do that uh, uh, to abide by public reason. But we, again, we, we're not really interested in that because we think that actually there are, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, maybe even uh, uh, higher cost in abiding by public reason uh, when others are not doing that. So some costs have to do with really the, the material disadvantage of uh, trying to um, move towards uh, a, a society that uh, um, respects the core interesting of all um, people, right? So including those people who 
uh, are not complying by public reason, why others uh, are, are actually trying to keep some so, so the, the resources for themselves, right? So you are kind of uh, doing something for all, while others are not willing to do the same, right? And there are material disadvantages in, in, in doing that. And you can think that uh, if you are at the receiving end of oppression, the costs are even uh, um, higher uh, because uh, if the critiques uh, are right, uh, it, you know, those people who think that disruption uh, and uh, some, some violence might be uh, important uh, in, uh, in fighting against oppression, uh, not, not resorting uh, to those kind of actions uh, might mean that you are uh, diminishing your chances uh, of redressing the injustice that you suffer from uh, and uh, also reducing your, your ability to affirm uh, your uh, um, uh, self-respect, your agency in the face of injustice. Okay, so uh, when are actually people relieved? of the duty of public reason. Now, the, um, the political liberals who have uh, tried to make a, a contribution uh, on this debate uh, have a kind of peculiar approach to the, the, this question. I'm not gonna go into the details of Andrew Lister and R.J. Leland uh, proposal because they, they are a bit <laughs> Uh, uh, technical, but what matters here for this talk is that um, uh, they both try to uh, think about, in a sense, the number of people who are not uh, abiding by public reason and trying to see if the number of people basically justifies uh, uh, the uh, relief of the duty of uh, public reason. Um, now, we think that the sort of way of basically ad counting uh, um, it's quite unsuitable to think about when uh, uh, people are indeed relieved uh, um, uh, of the duty of public reason, because in a sense, um, the number of people who are not complying is not the, the only or the main thing that really matters. So I'll just give you an example, okay, because I, I understand that this is becoming a bit vague. Okay, so um, uh, let's take... Uh, 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 Patricia, okay. Um, let's imagine that Patricia uh, lives uh, in, uh, in a society um, where the, the majority of people are not uh, abiding by public reason uh, um, simply in the sense that uh, they are uh, um, making uh, uh, relevant political decisions on uh, the basis of their religious convictions uh, rather than on the basis of uh, uh, public reasons. Uh, but let's imagine uh, that this religion is actually a, uh, a religion uh, um, uh, that is quite um, gender egalitarian. Well, but, you know, not the <laughs> one that the religion might be, but let's just, for the sake of argument, uh, saying that th this particular religion is, right? So um, let's imagine that Patricia um, uh, belongs to the, uh, the, the group of women. Um, and in a sense, uh, uh, Patricia can be reassured uh, that even if the majority of her fellow citizens uh, are not complying, technically speaking, with public reason, they have uh, uh, an interest, uh, uh, they, they take care of uh, um, Patricia's core interest as a woman. Right, so they're not, for example, let's say, passing uh, uh, laws uh, that uh, will prevent uh, Patricia from uh, um, uh, entering the job market, uh, will uh, violate Patricia reproductive rights, and so on. Okay. Uh, so this is a society where the majority of people are not really um, complying by public reason. Uh, but let's imagine that now Patricia moves uh, to uh, another country. This is a country um, where um, there are fewer people who are not uh, uh, complying by uh, public reason, um, but they are not complying by public reason because uh, they make political decision that really restrict the rights, the basic rights and opportunities of Patricia because they, for example, think 
that women are not equal. Uh, they hold a really sexist view. And let's imagine that actually this group of people have lots of power. They occupy crucial uh, positions of power in a society. So in a sense, the ad counting game uh, won't help here, right? Uh, because uh, in the second society, um, there might be fewer people uh, who don't comply by public reason, uh, but we might well say that uh, um, uh, Patricia's core interests uh, are uh, um, violated uh, in a very basic way in that society. So what we think uh, that political liberals uh, forget uh, is that there are different ways in which public reason can be violated uh, um, and, uh, and by different uh, people who might have more or less power. Instead, what we argue in the paper is that uh, uh, persons are bound by public reason only if they can see that their society is at least reasonably just, uh, specifically to the social groups that they belong to. So what does it mean that the society is reasonably just? It means that uh, um, it provides basic rights and opportunities for all, uh, uh, it gives special priority to such rights and opportunities, and it also provides uh, um, uh, all-purpose means for citizens to make effective use of those rights and opportunities. So for those who are familiar with rules political liberalism, that means that uh, a, a society uh, is uh, legitimate uh, in uh, a um, Russian sense of the, uh, uh, of the term. When uh, persons can see that that society um, is uh, uh, reasonably just in that way, they are not bound by uh, public reason. Uh, and this, I think, kind of captures some, some intuitions uh, that uh, many might have. Uh, um, um, so for example, like James Baldwin famously uh, said uh, that he, he, he cannot really know what is in the heart of white people. What he can see is how white people care about uh, um, uh, black people uh, by looking at the institutions uh, at this, in, in the United States, right? So, and, and that's our view capture that, that powerful intuition, right? So uh, it's uh, on the basis of uh, the, the institution and the, the, uh, the justice uh, uh, of those institutions that uh, um, uh, people belonging to, uh, to, to groups uh, uh, can uh, um, assess whether they are bound by public reason or not, not by just, you know, uh, by ad ad counting those uh, uh, fellow citizens who abide or not uh, by public reason. Uh, this means, right, that uh, uh, unlike other accounts uh, in, uh, in, in the literature, we think that uh, the application of public reason is not uh, an on-off switch. Uh, it leads to differentiated obligation uh, in, uh, uh, in societies. So basically, in, uh, in present-day society, which are far, far away <laughs> from being reasonably just, uh, um, members of privileged groups uh, must be civil uh, um, because uh, the institution of that society, uh, in a sense, respect their basic rights uh, and opportunities. But um, members of uh, groups that suffer from severe injustice uh, should not be bound by public reason. Um, so, for example, African Americans are allowed uh, by our account to resort to disruption and violence to pursue their political agenda. I don't think that I have to explain to uh, to you why this is the case or why like uh, uh, the um, institution of the US don't count as reasonably just uh, from this perspective of uh, African Americans. Uh, okay, that being said, of course there is an, another important question, right? So if uh, uh, groups that suffer from severe injustice are not bound by public reason, uh, is there any 
moral constraints that uh, um, applies to the, the type of actions that these groups can uh, um, uh, take to fight against uh, their own oppression. Now, usually uh, in, uh, in the literature uh, on the ethics of uh, resistance, uh, um, people come up with uh, some uh, type of uh, moral constraints, right? So even if they, they justify the use of disruption uh, um, uh, by those who um, suffer from injustice, uh, they also want to, in a sense, uh, provide some, uh, some conditions uh, uh, that this sort of actions needs to uh, meet. Um, so um, in, um, in the paper, we provide two uh, conditions by drawing on the resources of political uh, liberalism. Uh, and we are kind of tentative with some other conditions, uh, uh, but we, we feel confident that at least we can uh, uh, put forward the two important conditions. So usually in the literature and the ethics of resistance, uh, uh, there is this so one, one so-called success uh, condition. So you can... Uh, take uh, some disruptive action if uh, uh, there, uh, uh, there is, you think that there is some sort of uh, um, prospect, right, for success. So going back to uh, Rawls' definition of reasonableness, uh, uh, we think that, right, the, the, the concern for the cost of compliance with public reason uh, in an ideal condition is actually integral to reasonableness. So reasonable people, by definition, uh, um, should uh, really think about uh, the cost of compliance so we, we, with public reason. And if it's like irrational self-sacrificial on their part to abide by public reason, but they shouldn't do that, uh, or that they are allowed not to do so. So victims of, of severe injustice uh, um, should uh, consider tactics uh, uh, that have a reasonable chance to diminish the cost that others impose on them by violating public reason. So um, they should think about which kind of disruptive actions have the higher chance of success in uh, um, countering uh, those violations of uh, fundamental rights, uh, basic opportunities, uh, uh, violation of the, the, the social minimum that uh, everyone should be guaranteed. Uh, um, and so this sort of actions uh, should be given priority. Um, we also think that uh, from a political liberal uh, perspective, there should be some side constraints uh, on the actions that uh, uh, those at the receiving end of civil injustice should uh, take. And again, this is quite a uh, um, a, um, a natural move uh, in the ethics of, uh, uh, of resistance. Uh, very few scholars will say that anything goes, right? There are some things uh, uh, that uh, may be ruled out. Um, and, and so we, we, we put forward what we call the no compounding of severe injustice uh, condition. Okay, so let's again go back to reasonableness. Um, by definition, reasonable persons have a desire for uh, a social world in which they, as free and equal, can cooperate with others on terms that all can accept. And that's like Rawls' uh, definition. Now, uh, trying to fight uh, against uh, your, uh, the, the injustice you are, the severe injustice you're suffering from by taking actions uh, um, that uh, uh, might make uh, someone uh, who is also suffering from uh, severe injustice worse, uh, that's inacceptable. It's not reasonable. So it's never reasonable and so acceptable uh, um, for uh, the, the oppressed uh, to support uh, any plan to, to reap gains for themselves by compounding under group severely unjust condition. Now, in the context of uh, oppression and fights against oppression, uh, there are gonna always be some people who are paying the cost, okay? Uh, but there are some uh, groups or like some uh, like uh, uh, agents uh, um, that won't be so worth off, right? They can actually pay this cost and others that cannot. So, um, now, 
in a sense, it's sort of not compounding of severe injustice condition, might seem quite uh, logical, right? But um, it's very hard to, to find uh, a discussion of, of this type of condition in, uh, in the literature and ethics of resistance, even if we, we know, you know from a real world example, right? And really uh, uh, even personal experience that uh, very often uh, um, groups that are trying to fight against the severe injustice, they may do so in ways that compounds the injustice that others are suffering from. Um, now, this condition uh, will uh, allow for many disruptive actions that uh, 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 groups uh, suffering from severe injustice uh, are taking, right? So, um, setting fire on a car uh, or uh, like uh, uh, vandalizing uh, uh, a, um, a media uh, uh, company uh, uh, building uh, will be totally fine. But there are other ways uh, which will be ruled out. So um, take as an example uh, uh, the, um, the actions taken by um, some residents of Torre Maura. So Torre Maura is a very impoverished uh, um, neighbor in, uh, in Rome. Um, for the sake of argument, uh, we can assume that the residents in, in Torre Maura uh, are suffering from severe injustice because that's a, an area of the city that has been completely uh, forgotten and abandoned by uh, the, the Italian state. Um, so the, the, the residents of Torre Maura um, um, in fighting for their severe injustice, basically uh, assaulted uh, some uh, Roma people who were given um, uh, free accommodation by the uh, Roma the, the, um, uh, Council. Uh, that's unacceptable, okay? Uh, because of course, like in fighting for a severe injustice, which is having been practically abandoned by the, the Italian state, uh, what the resident of Torre Maura did it was actually compounding the injustice of another group uh, in the Italian society, um, Roma people, who are also suffering from severe forms of injustice. And interestingly, this condition uh, doesn't only um, uh, forbid uh, like more kind of violent and physical uh, uh, actions against uh, other groups that are suffering from severe injustice it may um, also um, forbid uh, any, even legal uh, or, you know, like uh, morally maybe unproblematic uh, uh, um, action that people take to seek uh, um, uh, political change. So uh, if uh, the residents of Torre Maura decided to uh, vote uh, for uh, a neo-fascist party um, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, promising to give them back some uh, social resources by, like, let's say, taking them away from uh, uh, the uh, other groups that uh, suffer from severe injustice in, uh, uh, in Italy, which, anyway, probably many residents of Torre Maura did. Uh, um, they, the, the type of uh, vote uh, is uh, morally problematic uh, from a political liberal perspective. So uh, this, the, this no compounding of severe injustice condition, a restricted type of action uh, that uh, uh, groups that suffer from severe injustice can uh, take, uh, not only in terms of like disruptive, uh, or violent actions, but really, like even you know, uh, actions that are not uh, disruptive or violent, right? So, like uh, uh, the uh, the parties that you are uh, voting for. Um, as I was uh, um, saying uh, in uh, uh, in the paper, we also go through some other tentative conditions, but I'll just stop here and uh, uh, yeah wait for your uh, uh, questions. So yeah, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for listening. I, I, I think that I can't, I can't, I can't hear you, Kerr. 
because I forgot to unmute myself. So I said, I thank you very much for a, a really stimulating, provocative talk. And I'm sure that it will prompt some questions uh, by people who are here, which will be glad to hear um, your questions. I have a bunch myself, but I have to wait. So let's <laughs> start with uh, Jonathan Kwan. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I, my question was about your claim that people are bound to um, public reason if they see that their society is just reasonably just to their specific social group. And I'm wondering why limit it to the specific social group that you belong to? Um, and I'm kind of thinking about mm. why is it the case that members of privileged groups have to be bound to public reason? One worry is that that might make them into bad allies for people yeah. who are oppressed. Um, and there, you might even think that members of privileged groups have special duties to try to undo the oppression of others. And if they're bound by public reason, they may not be, they may be unable to fulfill mm. that duty. Um, it's also a bit, here's a sort yes. of second worry here is it's a bit odd to talk mm. about reasonable justice with respect to a particular social group. Um, it's just odd to describe reasonable justice as a whole as some, somehow like a value you can pr parameterize or parameterize, that's the word, right? <laughs> to a yes. particular social group, right? Because yes. members of those groups, like they have certain rights that are protected and those rights are given special priority. But it may be the case that it's precisely because their rights are given priority over other groups. And that's the reason why there are, their um, rights lead to the oppression of others. So one could say that you could only ever talk about reasonable justice yep. for the society as a whole, never with only respect to a particular group. Yeah. Shall I just yes, apply yes, to each? Yeah. Uh, so thanks. Like very, uh, very, very important question. So, um, let me start with the first part of uh, your uh, uh, the first uh, um, question. So um, the fact that we think that uh, um, the uh, uh, our basically account of the applicability of public reason leads to uh, differentiated um, uh, obligations uh, um, doesn't mean that. Uh, um, members of privileged group don't have uh, other type of duties, right? So um, there are duties that privileged agents uh, have, um, and other people have uh, discussed the, 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 this, that sort of uh, uh, duty. So you can uh, uh, think uh, about uh, uh, duty of disgorgement, so if you benefit from injustice, you have a duty of disgorgement uh, to kind of relinquish the fruits uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the from doing your benefit from. And that's absolutely compatible uh, with uh, um, our count of the applicability of public reason. So that there are other duties that privileged agents might, uh, might have in the face of uh, injustice or other ways in which they can be uh, allies. Um, and uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, if you if you think that uh, um, uh, like um, these, these privileged agents uh, still have a duty of public reason, well, then they, they have a duty to do what is in their power, like through these sort of standard political channels uh, to. Um, to actually, for example, put uh, uh, people who are not uh, violating uh, the rights of uh, minorities in society into power and so on. There's a, also another way to look at that. So um, uh, a society like the, the ones that we have described are not legitimate from a Russian perspective, okay? Um, that means uh, that uh, everyone in that society, whether they're privileged or not, uh, um, don't have a duty to abide the law. And this is something that we, we accept, right? Um, so you can violate the laws of that society. What we are 
talking about is sort of this moral constraints that you have in seeking political uh, uh, change. Uh, now, why it's uh, it's not for everyone, right? Uh, uh, and you you are right that that may seem to be somehow odd to think that uh, a kind of reasonable, just uh, um, society is not uh, a. Mm, so if we if we were talking about a reasonable just society, it's just something that is a reasonable just for the perspective of some and not others. There seems to be something odd with that description. Again, that comes back to the difference between uh, the, the sort of legitimacy question and the question that we are interested in. Now, the duty of public reason, uh, as we reconstructed, is also really grounded on the question of cost. The question of whether for you as uh, an individual or individual uh, belonging to, to, a specific, uh, to specific groups uh, is costly to abide by public reason. Uh, and it's only when it's really costly for you um, that you are not bound by, by public reason. And there are people uh, uh, that uh, in, even in our current society, may actually abide by the duty of public reason without uh, like incurring in any cost for themselves. Now, some people, so the, the duty of public reason is so important that some people in the literature, like Andrew Lister, actually think that uh, it's enough uh, uh, to have just one reasonable person in society for you to be bound by public reason, okay? Um, what we are saying, that's not the case. But again, like if you are a member of the privileged group and you are living in a society that is not reasonably just in general, as you were like uh, hinting at, you are living basically in a legitimate society. So you can have the right to violate the law, for example. But when you are justifying to your other fellow citizens your political decision, you are still bound by the duty of public reason. There are many things that you can do and you should do as an ally that are compatible with the duty. Uh, there are others that are not. Um, okay, you have uh, we have uh, several questioners, but oops, uh, oops, yes. But I wanted to just. Um, one of my questions was, in fact, the first yeah. one that, that Jonathan asked, yeah. and I, I'm not happy with your answer. Yes, yeah, that's fine. Uh, because just to put it uh, kind of yeah. quickly, uh, let's say I want to uh, join uh, in a protest um, in solidarity with uh, Blacks who are protesting uncivilly or whose protest has the potential for becoming uncivil. On the way you framed it, at least in your presentation here, I wouldn't uh, have an ability, uh, you know, it wouldn't be right for me to act in solidarity with them. I'd have to drop out of the protests when it turned uncivil because I, as a member of a relatively privileged group, although in some other respects, not privileged, but still not in your sense of uh, most privileged, uh, would, would have to act civilly the way you presented it here. Whereas it's only the blacks who are actually literally members of the most oppressed would have the right to act uncivilly. Now, uh, you couldn't you, have meant it, but yeah, yeah, they would yeah, have yeah, that yeah. implication, which seems really odd. Uh, yeah, there, there may be other, like, so you, you may be, um, you may join the, uh, the protest, but yeah, you may not, you, you may not have uh, a, um, a, a moral uh, right uh, to uh, burn down uh, a police district. Uh, because uh, you are not like uh, well, I, paying I don't the wanna, cost. I don't want to burn. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but uh, that's what. No, I, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah, odd yeah. that I'd have to like make sure in the middle of the protest yeah. to retreat to the back of, to the back of it and you know have clean hands because because I'm a privileged. It's just kind of weird. Well, it's not about having clean hands. It's also about what you like, sort of hone. Huh? to the rest of society, in a sense. So as I was saying, we are not saying that uh, uh, you may not have uh, like stringent duties as an allies, but we think that uh, when public reason applies, uh, 
so when it comes to the duty of public reason, there is a difference uh, um, when it comes to those people who are suffering from severe injustice and those who are not. Well, let's say it was a more uh, even yeah. more obvious case of Tiananmen Square or something like that, um, which is, of course, not legitimate, but or something that could happen in the U.S., where it got to the point where we were in the uh, situation of, you know, rampant fascism, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, wouldn't the duty of solidarity be sufficiently important um, or, you know, or if it was some rampant injustice it just seems odd to make it uh the legitimacy yeah. of the action be dependent on my class standing or my status in society rather than what we are doing and whether the action we are doing is justified there is a thing in that case a clash of duties uh, between the duty of public reason and might be the duty of solidarity right and in a sense and there are very often uh, the some clashes of, of duties right and then the question is uh, not so much whether the duty of public reason can accommodate the duty of solidarity, but whether one should take the priority over the other in that sort of situation. So I'm not saying that it shouldn't, or it, you, you, you may not argue that it, it does. What I'm saying is that in that case, there is mm. a clash of duty. So if you think that there is a duty of solidarity, a moral duty of uh, solidarity, and there is a moral duty of public reason, uh, then the question is how you navigate uh, that conflict of duties. Uh, but again, but, but in, in a sense, uh, um, okay. it's not uh, the, the, what we are doing in the paper, right? So what we are doing in the paper is, is arguing that uh, the oppressed don't have uh, a duty of, uh, of public reason. Uh, and that's what we are really interested in doing uh, in the paper. Just one uh, more I'm, try. Yeah. One more try. Let's say, uh, <laughs> let's say we were standing around in Brooklyn and we observe an officer suffocating a black person on the street. And uh, we want collectively to take some kinds of action if possible. Uh, why wouldn't I have, uh, why wouldn't the situation justify all of us collectively taking an action, even if it wasn't in so that's, uh, accordance that, that, with law? No, that's, a, that's permissible to do. Like that doesn't have to do with the duty of public. So the duty of public reason is a duty to take certain actions when you are seeking political change. That's not, that case that you are describing is uh, a, a different case, right? It's this case of someone, uh, as you were saying, like just uh, violating yeah. the rights okay. of someone and you interfere. So it's, it's a duty of how you are seeking political uh, change. The situation you are describing. Uh, okay, you're right. That wasn't I mean. a good example, but I could come up with a better one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I no. just think that the actions yeah, of yeah, yeah. No, I see the, the Yale point. Green, this is one I was involved in. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. On the Yale Green in defense of the Black Panthers for the sake of uh, transformative change, or against the Vietnam yeah, War, yeah, yeah. For the sake, with all sorts of other goals built into it. It doesn't depend on my being subject to the draft. Whether or not yeah. the action was justified, it seems to me it's a question of whether the action is justified, not just whether the persons involved have a right to... Yeah, but was, what I'm saying, it might be justified for other reasons, uh, not because of uh, a public reason. And again, we are going to be back to have like a conflict of duties there. Okay, Alex, you're next. All right. Hello. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for this this very interesting talk. Um, I really enjoyed it, and it provided me a whole bunch of questions. So I'll only give you the most interesting one first. Um, I have a worry about words like severe injustice. Mm. And it's actually the same worry that shows up with regards to um, reasonableness. Okay. And that's, we just disagree on what's reasonable and which injustices are deeply severe and which ones are, you know, sort of minor, um, go along and get along, uh, be reasonable about this. And so the example I want to give, um, um, goes with, I, I believe it's called the Very Large Telescope in in Hawaii. 
Um, mm -hmm. The very large telescope is this really cool scientific object that does all kinds of good things for astronomy. It's also built atop a mountain that is sacred to indigenous Hawaiians. Yeah. Now, if you ask an indigenous person, um, um, gen generally speaking, um, they're, they're going to say something like, yeah, that's not sacred to me. That's not my religion. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it's sacred is a part of reasonableness. And so um, it, it, to, to a, a good extent, indigenous peoples around the U.S. sort of agree with um, Native Hawaiians that this telescope really ought not be built there. Okay. Um, and there's a, a public reason kind of, yeah, you shouldn't build, you should build stuff on sacred land. Um, but this kind of public reason, this, this um, kind of argument doesn't necessarily translate into the broader context of US public land. We don't really, um, you know, a lot of us don't really think of things as being sacred. And if we haven't got a religion, um, or something is sacred to a religion that's not ours, you sort of don't really care and think of that as outside of public reason. And you've got to come up mm. with another reason why we should give you back this entire mountain that we took yeah. from you a long time ago and we have all these investments in, mm. um, this, that, and the other thing. And so then, not only is there the question of reasonableness here, there's also se the severity because we disagree. Maybe we can talk about our disagreements reasonably. Yeah. But the indigenous Hawaiian is going to say, this is a big deal and it matters a lot. Whereas other people uh, with different Inside. perspectives, including marginalized people, um, including very oppressed people might say, come on, who cares? You haven't lived on that mountain in your whole time. Meanwhile, the water in our city is poisoned. Meanwhile, the, the police are out there killing us. Meanwhile, other serious bad things are happening to, to you and your people in the islands in your state of uh, colonization. Mm. try caring about something that matters and of course right. this doesn't get much uptake and so you can see how yeah. i'm interested in these questions but what counts as very severely oppressed and what counts as reasonable talk are really bound up in the big problems i have with political liberalism in general small small letters not just roles that we disagree not mm. only on stuff but we disagree on what matters and why it matters so yeah yeah th thanks like you know great uh, uh, great question i guess that I, I'll, I'll try to reply also um um in a sense because like your question is uh, um also an important question about i guess the whole framework itself right my reply might not be um uh might not satisfy you uh and this is because uh in a sense, that's why I, I included that meme in my slides. Uh, what I guess very often makes people infuriating about political liberalism is that political liberalism as a way of defining reasonableness, right? This might seem a bit circular, right? So you're reasonable in a sense, only if you <laughs> kind of endorse, uh, uh, in a sense, right? So, some of the basic tenets of political liberals. But what I reply to your question is that, uh, um, precisely the core of political liberalism is the, the idea that uh, like reasonable people disagree on uh, many things um like they have different comprehensive doctrines so they disagree a lot uh, when it comes to philosophy like religion and so on um they also disagree when it comes to justice uh, uh so they 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 have different uh, conceptions of justice but uh, because they are reasonable, all their conception of justice have some core features that they don't disagree with, right? And so they want to provide some basic rights, they want to like uh, provide some opportunities uh, and uh, social minimum, right? So it's sort of um, really uh, principles, right? But if you are uh, like reasonable, you abide to. So uh, the case, you, so. I'm not, uh, in a sense, sure that uh, what our paper is trying to do, or like in general, our project, uh, and even maybe the framework of political liberties can give you an answer to those really detailed cases. Because what uh, the framework is doing, what the paper is trying to do, is basically saying, look, indigenous peoples, right, that, uh, and I guess that many of us, if not all of us in this virtual group, will agree on that, uh, uh, 
do suffer from severe injustice uh, in, uh, in the US and in other settled uh, uh, colonial societies, uh, don't have a right, a, a, um, a duty to abide by public reason in trying to seek uh, political change to their condition. Okay. Um, and so in a sense, uh, the argument of the paper uh, like works a bit more in, in general terms, right? We'll say, look, uh, if in, 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 your case, in the sort of general case that you, are, uh, you, you were mentioning before, if indigenous people wants to um, resort to some uh, disruption, uh, like you know, block uh, some uh, works uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on the, the, the public water, or you know, they, they have a right to do so. Um, it doesn't go into the detail about uh, this sort of specific case of, uh, of the, the mountain, right? It's sort of more general about the types of actions that indigenous peoples uh, want, can uh, raise to, rather than uh, telling you whether uh, uh, the, 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 something should be built on their mountain. You see what I mean? So just operate in another level of uh, uh, analysis. Uh, um, I, I, I take on board, right, that there is a sense in which we disagree on uh, uh, what count maybe as a sort of thing, you know, if, if that sort of uh, injustice that the indigenous people are suffering from is so like crucial to their core, core interest, whether it's uh, um, so crucial, uh, is it so, so much part of the overall injustice they suffer from? What we are saying is, however, that uh, in a sense, if you, if you are a reasonable person, you, you should uh, acknowledge that they do suffer overall from a severe injustice, and that uh, gives them the, uh, um, the, the that, that relieves them of the duty of public reason. Okay, thank you. I'm sure that you have other questions, but we'll come back to more questions. Uh, one per person, if possible, but Callum, you next, and then we'll go around again. Callum? Oh, you're still mute. Okay, there we go. Sorry, don't know why that no uh, It happens to me every time, so no problem. Um, yeah, I think I want to push one more time on this line that John sure. and Carol were both uh, sure. uh, urging. So, um, my, so as I understand it, the sort of back and forth so far has gone, <laughs> well, doesn't this uh, uh, line that you've taken only, only liberate um, uh, members of the particular mm, oppressed mm. group in that particular injustice from the demands of public reason. Mm. And you, your response, as I understand it, is yes, but don't worry too much because these relatively privileged people, they might have other duties which are sort of more powerful than the demands of public reason. And that means they can still, uh, you know, join the protest or, or whatever um, because they've got these other duties that just like overpower the, the, um, public reason duties. Uh, and my thought is just, if that's your response uh, at this stage, then mm. why doesn't that response work just at the beginning? <laughs> why can't we just say to people like Srinivasan, yeah, these people do have a right to be angry. And that right to be angry is more powerful than their public reason demands to begin with. Uh, so even though they are subject to public reason demands, just like the rest of us, they've got these more powerful duties that just overpower the public reason stuff. And that's why we can say that it's fine for them to um, set fire to the police station or, or whatever the mm, mm, action mm, is. Mm. Um, so if yeah if the yeah, response yeah, yeah, so yeah basically unless there's a disanalogy yeah, between yeah, yeah, the yeah. position of the privileged, privileged yeah. people and the members of the oppressed group then then uh sure and if there yeah. is a disanalogy yeah, yeah. then doesn't the john slash carol line have some force that's the thought. yeah yeah so just uh so thank thank thanks uh Carl for this uh, uh push back because uh, I, I i'm aware of that sort of a part of the paper that is uh uh in a sense, more difficult to argue for, right? So I really appreciate uh, some, uh, um, uh, yeah, kind of uh, 
gentle or non gentle nudge, right, to kind of uh, work out uh, more uh, our reply to that objection. So just just to make sure that I understood you, right. So you are saying like, uh, why don't say from the very beginning, but. Uh, even uh, those who uh, suffer from severe injustice might be bound by public reason, but they may have other duties or rights, right? So it's, uh, that's your sort of... Uh... Uh, or or in particular, if that's the reason why... Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay yeah. for members of relatively privileged group to stand in solidarity with the oppressed group in this case, then why isn't that argument good enough uh, to work from the beginning? Um, uh, in other words, I'm, I'm not sure you can appeal to that response to John and Carol, mm -hmm. unless you think that that response also works um, in, in the case where you're not even thinking about solidarity, you're just thinking about the oppressed people resisting yes, in an yes. uncivil way. Um, well, yeah, no, no, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I think that I kind of got, got the angle of it. But, um, so the reason why is that uh, from a political liberal perspective, uh, the, the members of the group are not bound by public reason. So like if you like elaborate and like go deep into like Rule's notion of uh, what is reasonableness, uh, uh, what it means uh, for uh, persons to be reasonable uh, uh, and what it means for them to abide by public reason, what's the sort of link between uh, reasonableness and the duty of public reason, you need to, so that's I mean, at least our argument, you need to um, uh, conclude uh, that those uh, who uh, suffer from severe injustice simply don't have that duty. So in their case, it's not a matter of uh, try to figure it out uh, in, in, a, in a context of a, a conflict uh, of duties, uh, which one to give priority to, which might be instead the case of the members of the privileged group. In their specific case, simply that duty doesn't apply to them. So there is no conflict, uh, uh, no conflict of duties just, just uh, uh, arise, right? In the case of the privileged, um, as I was saying, like, you know, and I know that maybe that was a bit a, a sneaky move on, on my part, uh, uh, the paper doesn't really go into this co conflict of duty. Um, because that's not the aim of the paper. The, the paper is simply to argue that uh, uh, those at, at the receiving end of civil injustice don't have a duty of public reason and try to think about whether they may be morally constrained in other ways. Okay? So it's not about uh, then uh, navigating possible conflict of duties on the part of privileged groups. Uh, but in the case of the privileged groups, if you follow the logic of uh, Russian political liberalism, uh, there might be a conflict of duty, which is not the case. Uh, for the, um, when it comes to those who are uh, uh, facing severe injustice. So that's why we, we don't uh, use the card because we think that, uh, yeah, simply the duty of public reason doesn't apply to uh, members of the oppressed. They... Yeah, that definitely helps. I, I could maybe say one more thing, but sure, I know that yeah. we've got to move oh, on. Go on, Karen. Go on. That... Go on. <laughs> on this, if it's on. Yeah, so... Um... So I, I can I, I sort of buy buy that line if it's just look if we're just consistent yes. about rules what rule says mm. then we've got a reason to say that uh, in in the one case there's a clash of duties and in the other there isn't um, but the reason why I was worried is that the sort of setup of the the paper was not yes. let's go out to just find the most consistent version of public reason it was let's take these complaints that people like yeah. Trinivasan, et cetera, give seriously. Uh, we take these criticisms seriously if, if they hit. Yeah. Uh, and my thought is that if they hit well against the oppressed group, then it seems like on your line, they should still hit well against privileged people standing in solidarity with the oppressed group. It doesn't, um, like, I mean, so take just an, an example, right? So uh, uh, take, like, uh, Ju Juliet Hooker's argument, uh, uh -huh. uh, in, in that fantastic uh, paper she published in Political Theory. I mean, her argument is not about uh, 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 people who are racialized as white. Her argument is about uh, 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 black people in the context of the US. And what she's concerned about uh, uh, is that uh, uh, black people in the US are still uh, um, called out for uh, uh, not... Uh, 
acting civilly or acting in a respectable way, right? So it's a sort of a different kind of conversation. So she's not asking the question of what white people should do or can do. She's asking the question, uh, is there something wrong when we, you know, even within, uh, and that's like your argument, right? So even within like the, the black community, we keep telling that uh, uh, black people needs to, in a sense, you know, show a politics of respectability, show that they, they, they protested against their injustice in a specific way and that is going to actually help their cause, blah, 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 right? It's that sort of a line of argument. And she's saying there's something fundamentally wrong in mm -hmm. that because uh, uh, they, they have every right, every moral right of not, she also gives that other argument, but there are, no, moral mm -hmm. right of not acting in that way. And there is a problem in thinking that instead, you know, in putting on them that uh, specific burden. So in that sense, I think that uh, when it comes to that, that sort of argument, our revised version of political liberalism does incorporate that concern. Yeah, yeah, that so makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. No, thanks yeah. so much. Okay, so apparently Patricia had her um, metaphorical hand up, but she, she uh, the co-hosts <laughs> can't raise their hand, so for quite a while now. So I'm going to go <laughs> Patricia and then Sean. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Alessia, for this talk. Um, I am. Ha I haven't like. I, I studied Rawls uh, like in my foundational sort of courses in political philosophy, but haven't revisited it in, in a while. Um, so it's good to refresh my memory. And I've been thinking a lot about solidarity recently. Yeah, yeah. Also sort of align with the, the line of questioning. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what, what solidarity looks like within a political liberal framework. And um, yeah, so I appreciate your talk from that perspective. And I think I have another sort of cool, like way into this problem. Um, so, and I think it's it's more <laughs> trying, it's, it deals more with the like sort of foundational commitments of political liberalism. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so the exemption that you are specifying of um, oppressed groups from public reason stems from like ultimately from the irrationality or the self-sacrificial nature of following public reason for these particular groups. Like it is irrational of them to, to follow it. Therefore it doesn't apply to them, right? That's like the basic core of the argument. Yeah, so the, oh, okay. So, uh, so the, the core of the argument is uh, you, it's not reasonable to mm -hmm. expect uh, uh, those who suffer from a severe injustice to abide by public reason. In a sense, they can if they want, uh, but right. it's not reasonable to expect them to do so. It's not reasonable to expect them to do so because of the self-sacrificial nature often of those people following public reason, right? It's Because it would be, so, yeah. it, would, it would expect them to bear unreasonable costs. Um, yes if they were to follow, if we were to expect them to follow public yeah. reasons. So the, if understanding this, the core of the view is this idea of self-sacrifice that is irrational and not acceptable under the political liberalism framework. But I guess my, my like objection is what about the sacrifice of others? So why can't we say that it's irrational to um, follow public reason if other people are going to be sacrificed? Maybe it's not going to be me, mm. but it's going to be other people in society that have to bear unfair costs. And therefore I also have a duty not to follow. I'm also exempt from public reason because this whole sort of public reason framework is expecting too much of my fellow citizen or whatever. So I guess the, when, as I've been thinking about this, I'm like, well, I guess my objection is more to the de the narrowness of the definition of rationality that's embedded in okay. from the start, this individualist sort of definition of, of yeah. what it is to, to sacrifice and sort of whose sacrifice matters. Um, so yeah, I guess that's another way of thinking about, and it's not about the, the clash of duties that you've um, pointed out, but rather within the exemption. Um, mm. Why aren't others who are in solidarity also exempt yeah. similarly from public reason? 
Uh, so yeah, th th thanks, Patricia. So forgive me if um, so. What I'm replying to you may not really, uh, in a sense, reply to your question because I I may not fully understand the question. Okay. I think that's totally my fault. Okay, so it's just uh, uh, um, so in a sense. Uh, um, I mean, my reply will be, well, pub public reason, uh, in a sense, is, that doesn't apply, right, to the press. So, sure, um, yes. it, it, in, a, in, in that sense, it's not, so the duty of public reason, um, reasonableness, like, you know, this sort of political framework, it's not asking, uh, so that's at least our argument, right, um, uh, um, and you Lister may, may disagree, but um, it's not asking uh, to the oppressed uh, to um, sacrifice uh, their core interests and so yes. by abiding public reason. So um, if I'm uh, a, a, a member of a privileged group, uh, mm, it's so so what I'm trouble understanding that's what what's the link there because uh, since the public reason is not asking anything to the oppressed uh, as a member of the privileged group uh, uh, saying I'm not abiding by public reason because public reason uh, may ask too much to the oppressed mm -hmm. with being to the oppressed sorry <clears throat> I shouldn't, I don't have to abide by those constraints when my actions are in the interests of and to further the benefit and the situation and to relieve the domination of the oppressed is what I think she's partly getting at. Yeah, yeah. But that's, again, that may come uh, to, in a sense, uh, the the logic of political liberalism, which, as you were saying, Patricia, right, may not uh, appeal to you. So the question that uh, Rolls is asking, in a sense, is for you, right? So uh, mm -hmm. from your perspective, uh, abiding by public reason doesn't uh, incur in any cost. Uh, so you should do that. Uh? Mm -hmm. Right. As I it was saying before, then maybe. For me. Yeah. Um, this, so I guess this is the sort of thing. It's like, it doesn't incur any cost for me. But I think yeah. that's a problematic embedding of a, a narrow notion of rationality within the, the idea of public reason, because if it incurs costs for others, shouldn't that be just as basic, just as fundamental to that is you know, a sort of, you know, yes, of like, that, yeah. I shouldn't I shouldn't abide by public reason if I can't expect others to abide by it. The, yeah, and that's yeah, where yeah, yeah, the yeah, self sacrifice yeah. view. But yeah, 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 so yeah, I guess no, I'm no. like yeah. I'm trying to pin down the the, yeah, the, yeah. the four. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, there is a sort of uh, I mean I think but but uh, but fair to say there is a sense in which Rawls is also thinking about yeah uh, being rational. Uh, it's also uh, his understanding of rationality is also linked to yeah thinking a bit to what's the, also the cost for you right? What's the benefit mm -hmm. for you? in cooperation with others, right? So you are rational and reasonable yes. and you're reasonable if you see others in a certain way and if you think about society in a certain way, right? The fair system of cooperation. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and that's, uh, and that's I think also precisely why in a sense uh, there are uh, uh, the other people who, who have worked on the question of applicability of public reason will say, you know, the duty of public reason in a sense is so important, so uh, morally binding, that uh, um, it really doesn't matter whether uh, others are complying or no, it doesn't really matter the state of uh, injustice of society, you just do that, right? And we are, of, of course, like pushing back to that uh, without turning, uh, in a sense, like, keeping some of the core feature of the, the framework. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so in that sense, my last point is, sure. if we want to incorporate solidarity within the political liberalism view, the best sort of strategy is the competing duties rather than sort of in the exemption from public reason um, standpoint. Because, yeah, of, no, that's because, a, of, that... because of the assumptions of rationality that are core to political liberalism as a, as a framework. That's, uh, yeah, I know that's actually a very interesting point. To be honest, I, I, I need to think a bit more about that because in a sense, like mm. solidarity is not like, is not part of the, I guess, you know, like the sort of like gram, political yeah. grammar of uh, political liberalism, right? Uh, um, 
and there may be some, as you were saying, like some sort of like issues or at least, you know, kind of assumptions of the framework, right? That kind of uh, push yeah. back with that idea. Um, so yeah. A, a, and it'd be important to think about where solidarity fits in your framework because yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. about the kinds of things you're talking about. I think these are natural sort of questions that are going to come up. Yeah, no, as you were saying, one can be in a, in a sense of the clash of, clash of duty. So there are things that the oppressed may have a duty to do uh, or that I not to do. Um, and then it's a question of like, uh, yeah, clash of duties, but uh, they, they might have to navigate and that's something that yeah, we may want to uh, uh, work out. Uh, there may be other routes, right, for, uh, for solidarity, but don't lead to but sort of uh, uh, collection duty. So yeah, I'll, I'll think more about it. Yeah, thanks. So Shant, you have been very patient. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> thanks. No, I'm glad, no, it's been great to, to hear the discussion. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll throw in my thanks for, for the very thought provoking talk. Um, I'm not sure if my question is gonna sound hopelessly naive or not, but to I'll spit it out. I, I definitely saw and was persuaded by your description of how the duty of responsibility does not apply to oppressed mm, groups. Mm, 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 I did not immediately see how it therefore follows that violence and disruption are justified. If justified is okay, the word. Okay, okay. And I feel like I need a stronger defense of violence and disruption if that's what we're looking to sort of approve or condone, whatever the word is. A specific example I have in mind. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the George Floyd protests. There are two people currently in prison in New York City for throwing a Molotov cocktail at a police van. Yes. They are doomed in court. But um, if they were, if I, you were, if they're going to say we did this because duty of responsibility doesn't apply to us as an oppressed mm, group, mm. I feel like that's not a sufficient basis. I need a strong. I, I think a lot of people would like court of public opinion. People will want a stronger argument for, okay. for a stronger defense of this act. So, I mean, what's your? Is, mm. I don't know if this is a phenomenological question, but I mean, how would you answer that? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I take back. And I guess I mean, I may suspect that your question, uh, uh, yeah, is directed, of course, like to me, right? Because I, I'm presenting on on this issue, but my be I guess also a question directly in general to those who are working on the um the ethics of uh, of resistance right so what, what the, the question is always okay so you you don't don't uh, you are not bound by uh certain kind of norms of civility and so then uh, you you can like uh, use the disruption of violence so in, in terms of like power account the idea is uh, um, so the, the, in your case, right, so assuming that the, uh, the, the, uh, the people you're talking about uh, um, are members of the press group, uh, like the justification would be like you are suffering from uh, uh, severe injustice. Uh, and we take that there are many things that you can do, so you, you, you can like physically do to fight against like your injustice and protest against the injustice you're suffering from. Um, now we say you don't have to stick to norms of civility, like to public reason, right. because that duty do doesn't apply to you. And here the contrast is between uh, basically reasons, uh, so like kind of deliberation and this change of reasons, and then uh, other actions that instead are coercive, right? Uh, um, and what we are saying that you are allowed to use these sort of actions. Now, um, here the point is uh, other people have argued, right, that these sort of actions that are disruptive and violence can be very important for the oppressed. So sometimes they may lead to political change. So sometimes the only way you have is actually really to <laughs> disrupt things. Mm. Sometimes it's also just uh, uh, important uh, for you as someone whose political agency uh, has been uh, uh, violated to act in a certain way for uh, your self-respect, uh, for uh, recover that agency. Um, 
and so this is sort of arguments that others right have uh, have given and i i take that there is some uh, some bite to them okay um so what i'm saying we are saying is um, um all these reasons that people have given for why disruption and violence in the context of uh, uh, of oppression, of severe injustice, uh, are actually useful uh, or like justified, uh, uh, are sound. And what we are saying is uh, political liberalism can actually incorporate them uh, and uh, provide a space uh, for those who are oppressed to use this sort of action. So in the case that you were, you were mentioning, um, I take that. Uh, uh, those uh, who, uh, yeah, like uh, for you, did, did, did uh, uh, the Molotov, uh, um, either they were they were doing that to to protest uh, against uh, the the civil injustice they suffer from. Maybe they didn't necessarily think that that specific action would have led to a, a radical um, a revolution in mm -hmm. uh, 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 law enforcement. Uh, uh, but maybe they were doing so because that was a way for them uh, to recover their political agency in a context of a society that denies that agency. Yeah. See what I mean? So, that, you know, th there are justification out there for why these sort of actions uh, are important uh, to those who are oppressed. Um, and we take that these sort of arguments are uh, compelling, precisely because they are compelling. Uh, with, you know, we, we, are, okay. we were worried. Uh, but it seems that political liberalism can can act. I guess that, where that, where that leaves me is if there's a kind yeah. of wholesale system for mm. validating acts of violence and disruption. Yeah. How how would you recognize an act of violence or disruption, which also I think are significantly different things. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you bring yeah, up yeah. like the civil rights movement in the U.S., yeah. I mean, the, the leaders there made a point to distinguish between those two things. I'm not sure how, under your terms, we would be able to recognize an illegitimate act of violence or disruption. I mean, is every action that someone takes, as long as they claim to be oppressed, validated? Um, so that, that's why we kind of put forward some conditions, right? So that's why, first of all, there is a sex condition that kind of uh, uh, binds you to try to find uh, those actions that uh, can, uh, you, you think that can be, uh, effective uh, at actually alleviating uh, the severe injustice you're suffering from. And right. there may be actions that actually are not doing that. That's why we, we have a no compounding severe injustice con uh, condition, right? So um, if you're suffering from severe injustice, right, because you are uh, uh, racialized, uh, uh, in uh, uh, in your society and uh, you uh, to, to recover your political agency, you just assault uh, uh, a, a gay person. Well, that's not okay, right? right. Um, we in, in the I, I didn't go through that, but in the paper we try to uh, uh, put forward a, a, a more tentative uh, uh, condition to distinguish basically between uh, uh, violence that then uh, affect the physical integrity of people from uh, other types of violence, which can be like violence against like private property. And we think that political liberals can have resources uh, in, in its um, conception of uh, persons as self authenticating uh, sources of uh, moral claims to think that, you know, like assault to physical integrity, like, you know, making someone disabled or uh, uh, are actually ruled out. So there are this sort of uh, moral side constraint, right, to these sort of actions, uh, the kind of limit to what you can actually do. Uh, no, no, that makes sense. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so now I get to uh, ask a couple more questions. Um, I'll start with my most civil question, which, <laughs> which, which is just to ask you about yeah. um, something within, for clarification, why yeah. did you not uh, why did you leave aside the idea about reciprocity as a, a potential way of establishing um a difference because the relation of oppression is of course non-reciprocal yeah, uh, yeah yeah i was yeah. just curious why you mention it and then drop it and what was the reason for that that's my most the easiest question yeah 
So shall I just, uh, so, yeah. so but that's, that's a sort of a route that uh, people like Lister and uh, Leland right. take. And I, I think in a sense, a sort of route then leads you to some uh, a bit uh, uh, weird implications. So um, in, in the case of, uh, of Lister, for example, uh, um, uh, so he argues that uh, because so the duty of public reason is the duty that you have towards your fellow citizens, right? So in a sense, uh, it's it's a, it's about the relationship and the justification that you give to them. Well, that's you know that's enough that you you have one person uh, that abides uh, by a public reason for reciprocity to kick in, right? So you there is someone who is kind of reciprocating, and that's enough. Leland talks about a critical mass or you know enough, oh, enough people. Okay. So there is a bit of sort of uh, yeah uh, there's a, yeah there's a reciprocal reciprocity yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, between the standing of whole groups of people that I was just gonna um that yeah but of, reciprocity is also on. in a sense at the, co the core of our arguments in a sense is that right. you know was... in, in, in the the those who are not complying by public reason they are not reciprocating your kind of effort to do so right Right. So I was just uh, going in that direction. Uh, but also uh, two more things. I mean, it's mm, it almost uh, no. The uncivil way to put <laughs> it would be that it's almost a reductio of public reason the way. OK, but the okay. real issue is, um, you know, also on the legitimacy thing, the conditions that you have make it such that uh, very few societies, if any, yeah. are presently legitimate. So the whole question of why one would then force this whole discussion into the context of public reason, given that they're not legitimate, that would be one question that I would have. Um, so nobody would have a duty, the way you put it, because even, even the privileged ones don't actually have effective means to develop themselves or something, because we have, the, in the US at least, we have the power of money that undercuts elections and, you know, and so forth. And so we don't really have even the basics of uh, of liberalism. So yeah. anyway, but um, I guess I really want to say uh, something else, which is that what what seems to me really um, at the root of the intuitions that we have about the oppressed is that they um, does bear on the questions that we were posing before, in the mm. sense that they are really um, we're under. The situation of the oppressed undercuts the very basis of political liberalism. It undercuts the idea that people are free and equal because they don't, they can't stand in free and equal relations with each other. The, the society itself is fundamentally unjust, so that the basic conditions which political liberalism is supposed to be uh, carrying on or something are missing. And so this suggests that some idea of justice actually has priority over political liberalism, which would justify the sort of line that we're taking about solidarity mm, and mm, actions for the sake mm. of justice as being what's really involved mm, in justifying mm, or not the particular mm, actions mm -hmm. that groups might take or social movements might take to bring about social tr fundamental socially transformative change in which you could have conditions of free and equal citizens cooperating so yeah. i think that's actually the intuition which suggests to me that just saying that they are not required yeah, yeah, yeah. By it does explain why yeah you know several of us have thought that action in yeah. the interest of justice uh, if it really is, you know, at least ideally, actions yes. that are taken by anyone in the interests of, of justice in the sense of a society in which everyone would be free and equal are justified. Yeah. Rather okay. than this more narrow thing that given the framework so, yeah. of the liberalism in which supposedly we're free and equal, then only some people don't have to abide by it. This would explain why everybody taking action in solidarity with or in the interests of justice would be justified in certain cases if it wasn't, if it had certain side constraints, not like not violating the human rights yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. people, which is yeah. a more straightforward yeah. thing than the conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah, yeah. even in your terms, it would be yeah. like the basic conditions for yeah. free, and, free and equal and therefore political liberalism are yes. violated. Yeah. No, I mean, so there might be an issue. So here, in a sense, that uh, what 
the, the, the framework of political liberty design is not that, uh, uh, like, in a sense, for political liberty to apply people, like, mm. so for a political liberals, right, uh, people are ultimately free and equal. And so that, that's a problem when they are not treated as such. Right, mm -hmm. uh, so they lack the conditions. Yes, they lack the sort of conditions, but morally they are right. Okay, so even if they are, okay. yeah, I didn't mean to not suggest yes. that they're not being treated as free and equal. Yeah, so um, in that case, that's absolutely true. But uh, um, according to a political liberal perspective, very few society will count as legitimate. Um, I think that, that, that's, uh, that's absolutely true. That doesn't mean, however, uh, that political liberalism has nothing to say about the sort of society. So the question uh, about this sort of society is, uh, how, you know, what sort of uh, uh, political actions you can take uh, considering that uh, you are not uh, living uh, in a legitimate society. Now, the duty of public reason is not a legal duty, it's a sort of moral yeah, duty. So that's a sort of uh, uh, difference there. Um, so the question in the sort of society is whether public reason, uh, because the society are legitimate, doesn't apply at all or applies to some, not others, right? Uh, and what we, some people in the literature may say, it applies to all because uh, it does it doesn't really really have to do with uh, the, the the way in which people are treated uh, it has to do with uh, in a sense like yourself the fact that you are uh, you're reasonable we are, we are saying no the fact that you are reasonable means uh, that uh, you don't have to sacrifice uh, you don't you don't have to sacrifice some core, core of your interests right so the question there is uh, whether public reason applies or not uh, in the context of the society to whom that uh, uh, if, it, if it does or not right so um, uh, to whom it applies uh, um, so in, in, I, I think that in a sense the, our question is uh, is the same um, the, the, in the case of the society that are uh, unjust and illegitimate from a political liberal perspective and the context of political liberalism, justice and legitimacy actually go together, which kind of action you can uh, uh, take, right, to move this society towards greater justice and greater uh, legitimacy. And what we are saying is that uh, in this sort of context, uh, there, there are different, uh, when it comes to public reason, okay, when it comes to the duty of public reason, there are different type of obligations. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm leading always towards a sort of conflict of duty, because I think that there, there, there might be, right? And the question is how to navigate it. Well, even from the standpoint of success, none of these things mm. are going to be successful if a small minority group, which is relatively small anyway, is, is the only ones that can take you know, radical change. And I'm not saying it should be, I'm not, I'm a nonviolent person, but in any case, <laughs> disruption, dis, you know, or disruptive change, if say that is the most successful direction. And you, you, that sounds, you have to at least be able to address that, I think. Yeah, because, okay. Uh, okay. Since, yeah. Okay. Just think that it's, okay. it's weird to say that only those people have uh, the, um, the right to undertake a disruptive action, especially if that's the only one that's going to really make a, f a substantial difference or mm -hmm. holds the most promise for substantial change, because shouldn't we all be aiming at that substantial change? Yes, the question is uh, On what how ground? you, you do know, that. But, yeah. Yeah, I think. OK, I understand what you're trying to say. Let's put it that way. It's good defense of a <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah, I, I have a smaller question, maybe to shift gears a bit, and it's just about um, the condition where victims need to consider tactics that have a reasonable chance. I feel like I'm on yeah. board with third yeah. side constraints where you shouldn't yeah. contribute to the oppression of others. But yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, 
you know, we have no idea what stands yeah, yes. will stand to create just societies. And yeah, activism yeah. itself is a lot of risk taking and yeah, speculation. Yeah, yeah. So that sounds odd. And it maybe you wouldn't be able to even work out what does it mean for something to have a reasonable chance. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's a fair point. I mean, I think that uh, uh, so we we are endorsing this sort of success condition, and that's uh, generally a condition that uh, um, scholars who work on the ethics of resistance also uh, put forward, right? So, like even someone like Candice Delmas goes through a sort of condition, and then they, they may disagree about uh, what success mean, right? Means if it means. Uh, like bringing about a political change, or it may also mean just recovering your own political agency. I think that here the issue is about uh, um, prioritization of actions, right? So if you are uh, uh, a, a, an activist and you're kind of trying to decide about different uh, disruptive uh, type of actions that uh, you may take, one thing that you should do to think about which actions to take is think about which one may have a higher chance of success. So it's a condition that in a sense um, uh, push you to choose the, about uh, like uh, different uh, actions. It may well be, let's say, that uh, you'd end up taking uh, action A because you, you think that actually is, uh, um, it might be more successful in obtaining your, your, uh, your goals. And then uh, it turns out that action, action B will have been more successful. That's part of, uh, you know, in a sense, what can happen. But it's in a, your sort of reasoning of why you are prioritizing action over another, but the success condition kicks in. So it's uh, about, uh, I have to choose uh, what which action I'm taking. Well, I should take the one uh, that, uh, in my view, right now, has uh, the strongest chances of success. I may be wrong, and that's fine, but you are justifying the choice of that action through the success condition. Okay. That would be a lot That's of work. It's just like you right. just have to consider whether it's effective. Well, you need of to, course, like you sort would of like that, a... you like doesn't in, in a way that wouldn't really be a success condition. Then it's just you need to contemplate the issue, and well, you, it's you a, do it's, need to consider the possible consequences. It's but a sort of well, like you know. As far as so the, the sort of question is like in a sense, so what what you can and what you. Uh, you cannot do, right, in, in terms of the actions you are taking. And here the idea is uh, if uh, uh, you can say, right, that actually, you know, your, uh, your choice for action A is because you think that uh, it's, uh, it's more successful, that's the sort of action that you should take, right? The one that you think uh, is uh, more successful to reach your political goals, which can include... Uh, as I was saying, like even like covering your political agency. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. Alex? Um, I was covered to a good extent by that, but I was just thinking about how yeah. actions of resistance in the past that amounted to nothing yeah. may continue um, to, to inspire or have surprising long-term effects yeah but i think i think you kind of answered a lot of my concern when, when you noted that sometimes just exercising your own or your own group's political agency through the act like that might be its own success so i think yeah I think that was my worry yeah i guess it's just also yeah uh, thanks alex i think generally just to also come back to the general concern even uh, other people who work on the ethics of resistance like th there is a difference between uh, certain kind of conditions uh, within the conditions that people are putting forward. Right? So when we are talking about side constraints, uh, usually these sort of things are things that you can, you cannot do, right? So there is no way in which you can, uh, in our case, like compound other people's severe injustice uh, 
to try to improve your own uh, situation, right? Your condition of injustice, uh, the case of success, or even like proportionality, right? So that's not uh, a condition we are putting forward, but many people working on the ethics of resistance, like, uh, for example, like Adia Pasternak, like had their own version of the proportionality condition. That's again, like very, it, it can be very vague, right? Because uh, mm, measuring the proportionality of uh, an action uh, like against injustice is not is something that you know just to go back to what Alex uh, was saying we may actually quite reasonably disagree about right uh, for some uh, maybe absolutely proportional like throwing uh, some uh, 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 molotov uh, to a police van uh, uh, to fight against racial injustice for others might be like you no know, it's it, that's not proportional so I, I the, the side constraint conditions uh, um, bind people uh, uh, in a clearer way to do certain things and not do other things. The other conditions uh, are, in a sense, bigger, right? But they are there to sort of navigate uh, choices uh, that uh, people may have to make, right, Bet between uh, different types of action. Does make sense? Okay. I think uh, I think we should probably have we should stop, <clears throat> but um, please join me in thanking Alasia for a really fascinating talk. Very. Thank good you talk. so much for your very interesting and you know challenging question, which it's always a pleasure, right? <laughs>